What, what would you say you do here? Well, look, I already told you. I deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to. I have people skills. I am good at dealing with people. Can't you understand it? What the hell is wrong with you people? Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's time to talk about these Dan Slot tweets. Um, I know it, it's kind of weird. I, I don't think Dan Slot is very, I don't know, self-aware of actually who he is, maybe what he represents. But he, he has a tweet that we're going to talk about here with me to talk about that is the comic book writer, editor, the man behind the comic book version of Darkwing Duck, Aaron Sparrow. How are you doing, buddy? Doing good. Doing good. Let's uh, let's do another dance slot video. Oh, boy. Yeah, let's get right into dance slot. He's the gift that keeps on giving. I don't he should definitely delete his Twitter, his Facebook, any type of social media presence he, he has, because he makes an ass of himself a lot. But I do appreciate the content, Dan. I, I feel a little bit bad because I feel like maybe anybody who's on Twitter all the time, like I, I get on Twitter and I make comments in between doing things like I'm standing in line at the grocery store. You know, I need to kill a minute. I'll pop on Twitter, answer a few questions or, or make a few comments, you know, or just something funny occurs to me and I don't have anything else going on. I'll jump on. But I feel like there's a lot of people and, and maybe Dan's one of them uh, that, uh, they don't have a lot else going on. They don't have a robust social life. They don't have a great network of friends or, or something going on. So they just spend all their time on Twitter. And it, it makes it makes people unhealthy. Absolutely. He needs someone to tell him to stop. But this, this is what he has to say. When adapting comics to TV and movies or rebooting comics today, there's no reason to have the iconic characters be straight white men. The only reason they're that way in comics is because they were created in the 30s and 60s when that was the default. It's not the 60s anymore. Quickly, Robin, to the virtue signal. <laughs> I just, when when was this guy born? Was <laughs> Isn't he born in like the, what is he? Definitely the 60s, maybe the 50s. I mean, he's an old man. He represents everything that he's essentially uh, crapping on right here, isn't he? But Dan Slott is a person of color, right? He's, he's mustard. Perfectly- maybe he's got mustard on his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> He's perfectly, uh, this is the thing that kind of drives me nuts. And, and uh, you know, a lot of my friends that uh, that are, uh, you know, quote unquote, people of color, uh, he said that they get tired of, uh, they get tired of white people coming out and t- and like doing this virtue signal, like basically saying, you know, saying these things. Um, I have so many friends that are into comics and uh, they don't want the characters race swapped. They don't want the characters sexuality swapped because they are invested in the characters. They are actually fans. And they want to see that version that they love up on the big screen, you know, or, you know, it's, it's interesting because I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, and this is, this has been expressed to me more than once. I kind of thought it. And then, you know, I heard it, uh, I heard it from friends of mine that would say like, you know, we don't want the white character turned into a black character. We don't want the hand-me-down. We want the great black characters that exist or, or, you know, or the great, you know, whatever, whatever race, you know, but we'll just use uh, black as an example because uh, the uh, changing Kal-El into a black car- uh, into a black actor is uh, on the table right now. They'll say, we don't want that. We, we want the great black characters elevated and we'd like to see new ones created. Uh, we don't want the hand-me-downs of, you know, well, guess what? Here, we're done with the Flash. Now he can be black, you know, enjoy because we're done with him. You know, they don't, I feel like people don't want that. You know, there are people that celebrate it, but I don't know by and large that those are comic book fans. I think that those are just, you know, social justice fans and, and they see that as a victory. You know, they've taken another key, uh, key uh, piece of infrastructure away from, uh, you know, the, the cis white males, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing the comments, you know, how people feel about this, you know, and if they are, especially if they are, uh, you know, minorities, you know, do you like it when the characters get swapped? Do you like it when they get turned into, you know, another race to, uh, you know, so that some writer can uh, get some backpats and feel like, uh, you know, living in his mansion that he's really, really doing something for the downtrodden? What it reeks to me with on the part of Dan Slott and a lot of the creators in comic books and, and even Hollywood is sheer laziness. If you want a big, successful, uh, you know, thriving character that's ready to go to the big screen that, that represents, you know, uh, the black community. LGBTQ community, disabled community, whatever. All of these characters exist at DC. They exist at Marvel. You just have to go in and put on in the work and, and grow the audience and grow their relevance within the universe and grow their profile. 
they don't want to have to do all the hard work. They want to take all the shortcuts in the world and take, uh, you know, established characters that have name cachet, you know, do a race swap, do a, a sexuality swap, something of that nature on them and put them on the big screen and say, so look, we got a, a, a black Superman. There is a black Superman. <laughs> he already exists. And his name isn't Clark Kent. You know, that, that character is already out there. You know, and DC he's his Collins, own character. He's, you know, yes. he's his own character. You know, a lot of people pointed out that, like, they would rather have a movie about Icon. And I would rather have a movie about Icon than just see, uh, you know, a retread Superman with a race swap. I would rather see Icon on the big screen, you know, tell the story of him and Rocket. Let's let's get into that. Let's let's have some originality. Let's let's showcase the the wonders of this multiverse that creators have built over decades. You know, I, I think that would be great. I think an Icon movie would be fantastic. Uh, you know, Static Shock, you know, do do that. that. There's another great character that people love. You know, the, Marvel did it with Black Panther. They put Black Panther up there. You know, he's a character who's always been beloved by comic fans. And they did him justice on the big screen. And people responded. But people respond less to say, you know, obviously this movie was a disaster for multiple reasons. But, you know, the Fantastic Four, you know, people were upset that uh, Michael B. Jordan was cast as Johnny Storm. Um and, uh, you know, I, I was like, well, you know, I'm not really I'm not really a big fan of that. And uh, my friend was like, well, what, what do you you know, what would you rather see? And I said, you know what I would have rather seen? I would have this is this is going to like totally be the opposite of the point that we're making here. I said, I feel like it's done so that they can pat themselves on the back. Well, if you want to do that, then how about this? How about doing uh, just an alternate uh, reality Fantastic Four where the entire cast is black? You know, yeah. give me uh she would tell Edgy of four as uh, Reed Richards. Give me, uh, you know, Michael B. Jordan as Johnny Storm. Uh, give me Ving Rhames as the thing, you know, and, and give me Idris Elba as Dr. Doom. Yeah, give me that. Actually have the courage to put your money where your mouth is. But they don't want to do that because, you know, the belief used to be in Hollywood that, uh, oh, well, you know, black films don't sell. That's why when they did Spawn, t his best friend uh, Terry was, you know, cast as a white guy because they were like, well, we have to have a white guy in the cast because otherwise it'll be seen as a black movie and it won't make as much money. So it's the inherent kind of racist attitudes of Hollywood that are kind of like baked in and ingrained that had them make those decisions in the past. And I feel like it's the same kind of thinking that's having them make these swaps in the present is that they're, they're not thinking of characters. They're not thinking of what really matters. They're just thinking of people as surface traits and Hey, we'll appeal to this audience if we just give them this surface trait. We have had the announcement. It appears that even though DC Comics legitimately has two black Superman, you got President Superman and you do have Icon, which is part of the Milestones universe, which is relaunching, that they're going to, you know, um, the next, the reboot of Superman, because the Snyderverse is over, this is J.J. Abrams' Superman, with Tiny Isu Coates as the writer, is going to be Clark Kent, Kal-El from Krypton, but he's going to be black now. Well, there's a one-two punch of proven uh, <laughs> franchise destruction. Is that <laughs> absolutely? But Coates and J.J. Abrams. Oh my god! And they, some people are going to be upset about it. Some people, maybe a lot of people are like, "Oh, no big deal." But it's going to cause controversy. It's probably going to affect the bottom line for a character as well known as Superman. That's that's a worldwide icon. That's not a you know just something that comic book fans know or anything. And, uh, you know, they've already got a baked in reason. They can already, you know, once if, if it doesn't work out, people are racist. And I think that I don't like people. I don't think people like getting baited like this. They don't even want to get into it anymore. No, it's it's pretty much. I don't know why we're still repeating the cycle of t Ghostbusters 2016 that worked out so unsuccessfully. You tell people if you don't like that, you know, this isn't if you don't like it, it's not for you. And uh, but then if you don't, if it's not for you, then it's because, you know, you're a sexist or you're a misogynist. We'll, we'll kind of get back on the Dan Slot topic. We know that recently they they relaunched the Fantastic Four underneath Dan Slot. It's not doing terribly, but it's not doing nearly as well as it should be. You know, Fantastic Four should be a premier title. The sales are, are not terrible. This is the best thing that you can say about it. He also relaunched Tony Stark Iron Man, one of the most beloved comic heroes in the world. Never been an A-lister at, at Marvel, but it should be an important character. That thing has already been canceled and rebooted, and it was terrible. And then when you see a, a tweet like this saying, you know what? These characters were created in the 30s and 60s. The origins don't matter. The character histories don't matter. We should throw this all stuff all out the window when we're recreating them. And then when you see that's the doofus that they decided to, to lead the reboots of both of these franchises. 
How could they have possibly succeeded, Aaron? You know, give me the ideas from people who have a proven track record of knocking it out of the park. That's what I want to see. I don't really care what Dan's opinion on these things are because Dan has never delivered anything that has been, you know, wildly successful. I mean, what was the last the last big book that he had was maybe Superior Spider-Man? Well, I mean, Amazing Spider-Man was successful. Even the, at the end, the, the sales were, were still pretty good. Yeah, well, th that's Amazing Spider-Man. That book is is like Batman. It's always going to mm -hmm. hit a certain threshold. You know, you've got yeah. people who don't read it who come in and just buy it because they're, they're you know, it's part of their run. Uh, you know, I know all kinds of people like that. They're like, oh, I haven't read it in years. You know, but it's like I'm keeping my run going because I love Spider-Man. You know, that's the flagship title. So you're going to have a certain amount of that. And, and you know, nothing against anybody who, who does like his run on stuff. I think that, uh, you know, I like Superior Spider-Man. I wasn't one of the people that complained about it. Uh, you know, I've been in comics long enough to know that you shake things up. You do new things. It's not going to be permanent. You know, the, the main hero is going to return. You know, Th <laughs> Thor's going to get that hammer again. Uh, you know, Spider-Man's going to put that costume back on. Uh, Steve Rogers is going to get the shield back from uh, Sam Wilson. You know, these are the things that happen in comics. So I've never really sweated that. And I enjoyed Superior Spider-Man for what it was. But I think that that was a character. I think Doc Ock is a character that Dan probably has more in common with than the other characters that he that he's written. And, you know, and I think he injected a lot of that into the character. For example, I think Mark Wade's run on Wally West really works because I think that Wade being such a huge Flash fan over the years, when he was handed that title and he was handed Wally, I think he was operating under the same kind of fear of living up to the legacy of the thing that he loved. And he was able to somehow channel that into Wally, living up to the legacy of Barry. And that's why that book worked. You know, you have to find that thing that connects you. But putting Dan on a book like Iron Man, you know, Tony Stark is a character that Dan has nothing in common with. I don't think he could find any common ground with. And I don't think that, you know, I think that if you're going to write a genius character, you've either got to be an amazing writer that can fake it, or you've got to be kind of a genius yourself, you know, in some respect. You know, you put, you, you think of Jonathan Hickman writing Mr. Fantastic. It worked because Hickman is a very cerebral kind of intellectual guy. I don't think he's always the most connected to humanity. And I think that sometimes comes through in his writing. Some of his, sometimes his characters seem cold, but that works for Reed because, you know, he's living on that level. So, you know, he could kind of channel that into writing a really good Reed Richards. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, giving Dan the Fantastic Four, he's not very scientifically minded from what I can tell. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it's, I think you said it's not, it's not terrible, but it's not as good as it should be. I feel like that is the majority of what Dan produces. It's not terrible, but it's not as good as, you know, it, it's, but it's not as good as it could be. And I think that he just, he's been in it so long that I don't know that he has the interest anymore. When you are more interested in being on Twitter and making your opinions known than you are in finishing your scripts to the point that there's an entire documentary episode of a show where they have to bring in writers to help you. And it's like, isn't it funny that this guy can't meet his deadlines? That's a problem. And you should work on that. What was the joke? When Marvel reboots a title, they, there's no reason for them to hire a 60-year-old straight white man anymore. It's like, sorry, Dan Slott. <laughs> Did you put there, yourself out of the job? You know what, Dan? If you believe in this, if you believe in this so strongly, then why don't you step aside and let a younger, hungrier person of color write the book? Yeah. It's it's always good good in theory and to put it out on Twitter, but once you have to go and, and do it yourself, I, it's probably not quite as enticing to Dan. It's just kind of tone deaf virtue signaling it, uh, you know, and I don't like to use phrases like that. You know, you, you don't really hear me say like SJW or, or virtue signal that that often uh, because, you know, I think that those kind of become catchphrases that uh, that kind of lose their meaning over time because they get overused. But, you know, it is that thing of, uh, you know, this is my opinion and aren't I a virtuous person for thinking this. But if you really want to put it in practice, it's, it's kind of the same tone deaf statement as when. Are you ready to give up your spot, Dave? Yeah, when Brie Larson got up on and talked about, you know, the Captain Marvel movie and how they needed, she needed to, you know, we needed to elevate more actresses of color and things like that. And it was like, well, you know, the first cap, female Captain Marvel was black, right? It was Monica Rambeau. So why don't you, why don't you convince Marvel to do that story and, and you step aside if, if this is really, if you believe so strongly in this. But it's not really about that. It's about the, the narrow-minded self-interest of, you know, look at what a good person I am. I paid lip service to this. But in practice, I didn't really do anything. It's like the Louis C.K. joke. 
I was sitting on the plane in first class. A soldier got on. I thought to myself, I should get up and I should give my seat to this soldier. I didn't, but I felt good about myself for thinking it. I considered it. Yeah, <laughs> that makes me a good person. It's it's crazy. You see a lot of things like this. It feels like um, there there is there is something going on. I remember, I think it was in the early 2000s. You know who Andrew Wheeler is? I know the name. He was the editor in chief of Comics Alliance. Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. He spawned out that they spawned out Andy Curry and a bunch of uh, Yahoos. And one of the things he said in an interview was, "Like things will never be right in comics until Captain America has a boyfriend." And I do think that there is a, a conscience effort by some people, some players in in the comic book industry to go. To, to these iconic classic creations that, that they didn't have anything to do with the creation, the success of any of these uh, of any of these characters, these stories, and, and and try to go in there and fundamentally change what those characters have represented, what they are, like down to the core. We've seen it happen with Iceman uh, to very negative results. And I do think there, I don't know if I want to use the word, word insidious, but there's an active, there are active players trying to do this. And I think, you know, obviously, uh, Dan Slott would like to be. I don't know if he wants to be in on it, but he would like to it, for people to think he is. Well, why did Brian Michael Bendis change Iceman? Was it because, you know, did that stem out of the character or did that stem out of his desire to do something with the character? Again, it goes back to, did you write a good Iceman story or did you write the story that you wanted to tell using Iceman? And what he did was he decided that, you know, he wanted a GLAAD award or, you know, whatever the, whatever the kudos were for being, you know, being so progressive so he took a character who we have had around and seen his thought bubbles you know his heterosexual thoughts for decades and just decided that he was gay and thus that thus it was so and sadly Iceman has become a completely different character he's become a very poorly written stereotype that i think uh you know and and hey i don't want to speak for uh, i don't want to speak for anybody but uh you know if you're if you're gay and uh, you know what do you think of the Iceman character do you find him to be a stereotype or do you find him to be positive representation? Let us know in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, but, you know, I feel like most, you know, for the for most of us, he reads now like the 90s, you know, mm, girlfriends, you know, two snaps up kind of character that is actually doing it, you know, doing a disservice. And, you know, I th so is that the goal? Is that the goal, Dan? Is it is the goal that you actually believe in these things or is the goal to get yourself patted on the back? And if you really believe in these things, why not step aside then? Well, what if he really believes in him? He's a he's a big name of Marvel Comics. He probably has access to all these characters that are sitting on the wayside waiting to be used. He can probably go in there you know, and go work with some of these characters and start elevating stuff. Put some of his, his own sweat equity into these characters that could use some TLC and elevating rather than taking other people's established characters that have already made it up there. You know, and just essentially treading along on their on other people's reputations with other people's characters yeah no in, in some instances it works like you can do a care you know uh, miles morales didn't replace peter parker except in the ultimate universe but you know overall he didn't replace peter parker but he is his own character that's come into his own more so in the film i think than he's been had a disservice though coming into the 616 when now he's in peter parker's shadow yeah and it's like when you, he was you in the ultimate universe he was spider-man yeah, you can call him Spider-Man, but he's always Miles Morales Spider-Man. Uh, Jane, uh, you know, Jane Foster is always Jane Thor. She's not Thor, no matter how much they tried to make that happen. Jennifer Walters is not the Hulk. She is still She-Hulk, no matter how hard you try to make that happen. You need to have, let these characters have their own identity. There's nothing wrong with her being She-Hulk. There's nothing wrong with Laura being X-23 and not Wolverine. She was her own character before. Now she just seems like a, a cheap knockoff. You do the character a disservice. You do the people that you want to represent a disservice. Give people their strong characters and let them have their own identity. They don't need to co-opt the identity of, of somebody else. It's like, oh, things will never be right in comics until Captain America has a boyfriend. So what does that say about North Star? The first, you know, gay character that Marvel, you know, brought out of the closet. What does that say about Chen, who nobody remembers this character, but she was on Silver Sable in the Wild Pack? First lesbian that I remember in Marvel Comics. And that was in the 90s. So, you know, these these things are not... <laughs> it's not like these things just happened in 2015. They've been in comics all along. But the difference was they were done organically and it felt right. 
uh, I was watching, um, I was watching some, some movie and like within the first episode and the first five minutes, a character has to come out and say, my boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. Thus, in, thus, you know, immediately telling you that that character is gay. But then I watched the Umbrella Academy and uh, I don't think Klaus, I don't remember Klaus being gay or, or even bisexual in the comic books, but it seems like he's either, uh, but it seems like, uh, you know, um, yeah, I don't remember, I don't remember that happening in the comics at all, but uh, I could be wrong. It's been a while since I read them. But on the show, they introduce Klaus and you go a few episodes with him and then they introduce a situation and then slowly they build a relationship with him and this other soldier that he's in, you know, in Vietnam with in the foxhole. And you realize that, that, Kla uh, or that Klaus is, uh, is gay. Maybe, maybe bisexual, but, you know, definitely in a gay relationship at that point. And it felt natural. It felt organic. And it was easy to just go with the character because the story came out of the writing and not just being forced and thrown in your face. And I think that's a much better way to do it. It's a much natural or it's a much more natural way to do it. And if we want to get to this point where these things are, you know, seen as just not a big deal, then you have to treat them that way in the writing. You can't, you know, put out your big fanfare and get your, you know, variety article touting that you've turned Captain America, you know, you've given Captain America a boyfriend, you know, and, and aren't you great? Because people recognize that for what it is. They recognize it for pandering and not good storytelling. Yeah, Midnight and Apollo. Yeah, fantastic. How many years did it take before they actually said that they were gay? But you knew that they were mm -hmm. just from the situations and the way that they treated each other. Yeah, and it was and it was treated very naturally. The way that you know you would see, like you know, maybe maybe you're hanging out with a coworker, and then you know his uh, you realize that the person that uh, that he's you know brought the friend that he's brought, oh, they're together. You know, it's just it's not stated. It's just you realize it naturally, and I think that that works better. That's more true to life, and it feels it's always uh, better to show than tell. I guess. Yeah, exactly. You know, that's the way that, uh, that storytelling is supposed to go. So. I am not surprised that, that Marvel's had all these issues. I'm not surprised that they decided to replace all their classic heroes that were leading the billion, multi-billion dollar annual franchise with all new uh, new versions of the characters and they fall flat on their faces when you have people like Dan Slott with these with a tweet like this. I don't think he genuinely believes it. I think he's, like you mentioned, he was virtue signaling. I don't think he's ready to give his spot up. Hey, buddy, if you want to go out there and get the claps, you got to go and, and, and put in the hard work and you know offer up your spot if you really believe all these things. If you think it's OK to go and change other people's creations and, and after, after decades of work that people have put in there, I think people should probably, if you want to elevate these characters, they already exist. Stop creating new versions of these characters. Just keep elevating the ones that you have, bring them to the forefront, and people will recognize that they're important. You can put them in movies. You don't need to go and just swap all these characters around, whether it be comics, movies, TVs. There's so many creations that deserve a more spotlight than they're getting right now. Yeah, rather than turning, uh, you know, turning some random uh, eternal gay, uh, why don't you put North Star in a movie? You know, and that, that's that's a well-developed character long before his sexuality was revealed. Uh, you know, it was always there. It was always under the surface. You know, when John Byrne started Alpha Flight, you know, he never did, you know, he, you never saw any thought balloons where uh, North Star was pining over women. You know, you, you you kind of got like, there was some undertones of maybe, maybe this was a thing. And then, you know, eventually they, they revealed it. And, you know, he's a strong character in his own right. But they let him be a character. They didn't just make him a sexuality or make him a race. And I, I feel like people don't want to, do, writers either don't want to do the work or they don't know how to do the work anymore to build up a character and make them important, make them a fully fleshed uh, out fully realized human being and then just happen to reveal these other ancillary things about them you are not your sexuality you are not your race you are not you are a mix of so many wonderful things you know and so many different thoughts and feelings and and you know the human soul you're a mix of all of these things that's what's important these other things are secondary and i think that when you're writing a character you need to remember that